if you could pick any historical event to go back and be an eyewitness to, what would that be? I'm not going to receive answers right now, but just think on that for a moment. If you could pick any historical event, anything in all of history, to go back and literally be there and be an eyewitness to that event, what event would you pick? And perhaps what comes to your mind is maybe uh, seeing the great pyramids built in Egypt or, or being a spectator at the first Olympic Games in Greece. Uh, perhaps you think, man, I would love to be there at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Or I'd love to see the first men walk on the moon. Now, now switch gears, not just anything historical, but switch gears and ask yourself, if I could be an eyewitness to, to any event unique, uniquely related to church history, what would I want to be a witness to? Uh, for me, dozens and dozens and dozens of things come to mind. I would have loved to be at the Diet of Worms in, in 1521 as Martin Luther stands before the council before the peoples, before the crowds, before the council, literally wanting to kill him. And he says, quote, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, I will not recant. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. That's, that's one of the foremost events that come to my mind. I, I'd love, and I know Will will appreciate this, I'd love to sit in the congregation of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in the 1800s and hear Charles Spurgeon preach. Uh, better than that, I'd love to be on the day of Pentecost and hear the Apostle Peter preach and, and to, to see the Spirit descend and to see thousands come to Christ and baptized that day. And Perhaps you have a dozen other things that come to your mind. All of those would be wonderful to witness. But as I, as I was reading and studying and preparing for this sermon this morning and for this new series in the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's one event that, that I wonder if perhaps it should surpass all of those in our mind. And that would be actually to be able to hear John the Baptist as he paved the way for the coming of the Messiah. You know, it was a fresh reminder for me. I often downplay the significance of John the Baptist's ministry and John the Baptist's role in my mind. For some reason, I skip right past it, and I go straight to the action of the Savior. And, of course, that is the point. That is the very point of the Gospels. But it was a fresh reminder to me this week that the coming of John the Baptist was the single, single most important event that had happened in Israel in over 300 years. You see, there had been 300 years of silence. There, there had been 300 years since the last prophet. There had been 300 years of the people waiting. You had generation come and generation go. G generation died after another and nothing Happened, And then in God's perfect timing, all of a sudden, here comes this man, John the Baptist, this forerunner to the Messiah. This man whom Jesus says in Luke 7, 28 was among, he says, among these born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. This man who after the likeness of Elijah returns for the people of Israel. This, this return that the people of Israel had looked for generation after generation, and now here he comes. This herald and the primary witness of the, the inauguration of this new era, this fulfilled plan of God's redemption for his people. It must have been a, an incredible thing to witness. An incredible thing to witness John the Baptist come and to be that forerunner to the Messiah. Well, unfortunately, we can't go back in history, can we? None of us can go back and be an eyewitness to any of these events. But praise the Lord, through God's perfect, preserved word, we can go this morning and to see exactly what happened, to understand and to, to immerse ourselves in this and to try to, to visually paint this picture of being there when John the Baptist comes and when he paves the way for the coming of the Messiah. And that's what we're going to look at this morning in the first eight verses of the book of Mark. But before we do that, and before we even read our passage, I, I want to just sort of lay the land for you very quickly for this gospel, for the gospel of Mark. Kind of ask these who, what, where, when type questions. As we prepare for this 
months-long study, uh, perhaps a year-long study through this gospel as we walk verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. So let's do that very quickly, and then we will jump right into our passage. Uh, Mark's gospel, you may know this, is the shortest of all four of the gospels. And it's the shortest by a long shot. It's, it's a, just a barely over half the length of the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And, and it's a fair bit shorter still than the Gospel of John. Now, oftentimes for us, it's a Gospel, Mark is, that is more known for what it lacks than for what it contains. You may know this, but Mark includes no birth narrative of Jesus. Uh, no early childhood accounts of Jesus. No Sermon on the Mount from Jesus and very few parables and very little teaching compared with its other counterpart. It's it's a very fast-paced and action-packed gospel. Forty-two times we read this Greek word, euthos, which means immediately. Mark, Mark writes and he says, this and this happened and immediately this happened. And this and this happened and immediately this happened. It's a word that Mark uses 42 times elsewhere in the rest of Scripture. It's only used, I think, 17 times in the rest of the New Testament. Another thing that's interesting about Mark's gospel is though it is the shortest gospel, it actually includes the most number of miracles than any of the other gospels. J.C. J. Ryle puts it like this. He says Mark was inspired to write a history of our Lord's works rather than of his words. And so this gospel is a fast-paced and action-packed, getting right to the point gospel focused on the works and the, 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 the accomplishments, what Jesus came to do and who he was as our Savior initiating this new age. So let's ask just a few questions this morning. First, who wrote this book? The author is none other than John Mark. Now, there is no author directly mentioned in the text. In fact, none of the Gospels include an actual mentioning like Paul does when he introduces the letter to Ephesians. Paul, an apostle to the Ephesians. Uh, they, they just get right to it. They just get right to it in sharing the Gospel. In the Latin, all of the Gospels were actually just kata something, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to Matthew, according to John. But even though the gospel itself does not directly name Mark, there is no question that John Mark is the author of this gospel. The early church unanimously agreed on this point. In fact, there is no early church tradition and no early church father that ascribes this book to anyone other than John Mark. Now, now John Mark, just so you know, just to refresh your memory, this is the same John Mark that was a cousin of Barnabas, the same John Mark who accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey, and the same John Mark who served as the Apostle Peter's interpreter. Uh, That's what allowed him entrance into the canon. Though Mark himself was not an apostle, he was closely connected to an apostle, and that being the Apostle Peter. Now, when was this book written? I'm going to suggest to you that it was written in the late 50s, early 60s AD. Now, just like no author mentioned, there is no explicit date mentioned. Mark does not write and say, Mark writing in AD 56 to so-and-so. We have to use external and internal clues. And uh, scholars throughout the centuries have uh, debated and, and examined this external and internal Uh, evidence, and there's debate between really two primary time markers. Uh, The first group thinks that this letter, this gospel, was written in the the mid to late 50s, early 60s, before Peter's death and before Luke wrote Luke Acts. And the primary, one of the primary things is most scholars think that both Matthew and Luke used Mark's gospel as a reference point. They didn't copy it. They didn't plagiarize it or anything, but it was kind of the first one in the reference point that they then built on. The other option is that this gospel was lit, written in the mid to late 60s after Peter's death during the reign of the emperor Nero, but still before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That's important. It has to be. It is written before AD 70. But which option we take before the, between the late 50s, early 60s, or mid to late 60s, really both options are very possible. Uh, 
And both options have very strong arguments. I won't go into all the scholarly arguments. I'm just going to suggest to you that this gospel was written before Peter's death, before Luke wrote Luke and Acts in the late 50s, early 60s. If you would like any of that much longer footnote information on timing, come see me. I'll be happy to give it all to you. Next question for us to ask is, who was Mark writing to? Who, who was his audience? And this point here, we're going to say predominantly Mark was writing to Roman Gentiles. There's basic consensus that Mark's gospel is written primarily for Gentile readers and, and primarily specifically for Roman Gentiles. As compared to Matthew, who, if you remember reading Matthew, Matthew includes passage after passage after passage from the Old Testament, doesn't he? As it is written, as it is written, Mark is focused on writing to Jews to convince the Jews that this is your Messiah whom you have awaited for centuries and centuries. Well, that's not what Mark is writing for. Mark is writing to a Gentile audience and primarily a Roman Gentile audience. We, we know this, scholars know this, because Mark's gospel com contains relatively few Old Testament quotes. You won't see through Mark's gospel over and over like Matthew, as it is written, as it is written, as it is written. He includes some, no doubt. We're going to see it in just the second verse this morning. But relatively few compared to the others. He also, throughout the gospel, you'll notice, will explain Jewish customs and will translate Aramaic and Hebrew phrases into their Greek equivalents. He doesn't assume that his readers understand Aramaic. He doesn't assume that his readers understand Hebrew. He, he assumes that they're Greek-speaking Gentiles who need these things translated for them. Now, it is important, though, it is interesting that he does assume that his audience at least has some working knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament, of the Jewish scriptures. He assumes, for instance, as we come to verse 2, he assumes that his readers would have understood who Isaiah was. And that they would have been familiar with a prophet was that was sent from God. He assumes later that they would have known who David was and what God had promised concerning uh, his kingdom. He, he would have assumed that his readers knew who Moses was and what it meant to live according to his commands. So how I would describe this and summarize this is that Mark wrote to a Roman Gentile audience that he assumed had a basic, though not very deep, but a basic understanding of the Jewish scriptures and the story of God's redemption of his people. And so John Mark wrote this late 50s, early 60s to a predominantly Roman Gentile audience. Now we have to, have, have to ask the question, why? Why did he write it? What was his goal and his purpose? Well, the purpose is threefold. To lay out who Jesus was, what Jesus did, and what it means to follow him. Now, this is very important for us to remember as we approach this gospel or any gospel. Mark's gospel is not simply a biography written about a great man. It's not simply just here's what Jesus did, here's where he lived, here's what, all the things he said and did. It is not simply just cracking open a biography. It's not simply a historical account of what all Jesus did. You see, Mark wrote his gospel to help his audience understand more deeply concerning this story of Jesus, concerning who he was and what he came to accomplish. But all of this had an end goal in mind. The end goal was to convince his readers, to convince us even now, 2,000 years later, what it means to follow Jesus as a disciple. And that's the very same purpose for us today. We, as we approach this gospel, we do not want to be content just being able to better outline this gospel or just being able to better understand what this free, phrase means and what that phrase means and how to best connect them all in our minds. Those things are important. Historical timelines are important and they can be helpful to us, but they are only helpful and good insofar as they help us gain a fuller picture of who Jesus is of what he has done for our lives and what it means for us to submit our lives to him as our king and as our Lord and as our savior. So that's the purpose that Mark's writing. Mark is not writing just to give information. He's writing to convince, to convince people to follow Jesus and more fully understand what that means. The structure of the book is very simple. It's split into two major sections. You can really just split the book right down 
the middle. From chapter 1 through chapter 8, Mark highlights the person of Jesus. He highlights his miraculous power, his authoritative public teaching, his identity as the divine Son of God, long promised and prophesied. And then in chapter 8, we see this decided shift. And from chapter 8 through chapter 16, Mark focuses singularly on the road to the cross. And all that happened there, emphasizing the suffering of Christ and the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And right in the very middle of the gospel, in the middle of chapter 8, is kind of the hinge point. And that hinge point is Peter's confession. Uh, We'll come there later in in chapter 8, verse 26. But right there in the middle, we have this confession of Peter that, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the long-awaited for Messiah. So we could simply structure the book like this. We could say the first half of Mark speaks to who Jesus is, and the second half of Mark speaks to what Jesus did. And finally, by way of introduction, before we jump in this morning, let me give you quickly three pitfalls that I think we need to avoid. Three, if we're not careful, pitfalls that we can be prone to fall into. And these are allegorizing, over-harmonizing, and moralizing. And those are three big words, and you're scratching your head, it's too early for these big $3 words, right? But allegorizing, over-harmonizing, moralizing. Let me quickly explain for you what I mean by these and why we want to avoid these. First, when I say we want to avoid allegorizing, this, is, this would be an approach to the Gospels that every passage we come to, we're looking for some deeper meaning. We're looking for some under-the-surface hidden meaning to every passage in the gospel. But we must not do this because the gospel is not an allegory. The gospel is not Pilgrim's Progress. If you've read Pilgrim's Progress, that is an allegory. Every, everything is pointing to a deeper, uh, a deeper meaning. The gospels are not, not that. The gospels are realistic narratives that are true to life. They're narratives that that are a series of events describing the the realistic portrayal of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. So, for instance, when we come in several uh, months, probably, to Mark chapter 4, we come to the story of Jesus calming the sea on the Sea of Galilee by rebuking the wind and the waves. We do not need to look at that passage and allegorize it and ask, what are the storms of your life today that Jesus needs to calm? You see, when we do this, we turn a story about Jesus' power over nature. We turn it into a story about us and our problems instead. One author puts it like this, The great danger of allegorizing is that it can cause us to lose sight about what the Gospels say about Jesus in order to focus on us and our own circumstances. So as we approach every passage in this gospel, we want to be careful not to allegorize it, not to look beneath the surface, but to let the very surface meaning be what the surface meaning is, a story about who Jesus is and his power and what he has come to do. Uh, the second thing that we must be careful not to do is to over-harmonize. What I mean by this is we need to be careful to understand that Mark wrote a whole gospel narrative, a whole story with connecting themes and with connecting plot lines tying this whole story together. And if we're not careful, we'll come, because this is such a short gospel, because it is kind of a bare-bones, action-packed gospel, if we're not careful, what we'll want to do is come to every passage and try to fill in the details from Matthew and Luke and perhaps John sometimes. That can be helpful sometimes, and we'll do a little bit of it next week as we come to the baptism of Jesus and the temptations of Jesus. But while some harmonization is good and can be okay, we need to be careful not to over-harmonize. Because if we try to pull in every single fact and detail about every story that Mark leaves out from these other Gospels, what we will in turn create is a fifth Gospel. A fifth Gospel of our own creating that is not true to any of the other four Gospels. We need to let Mark's gospel speak for itself. What did Mark want to emphasize here? What were the things Mark was driving home to his audience? And what what is Mark driving home about our response to Jesus in this passage or in this section? Finally, we need to be careful not to moralize. Not to moralize. Again, I just want to drive this point home that Mark's gospel is a story about Jesus. Jesus. 
The various episodes throughout this gospel are not written simply to illustrate some moral or general life lesson that can somehow be disconnected from who Jesus is and what he has come to accomplish. We have to keep Jesus in the forefront of our mind, in the center of our focus as we come to every passage and not just try to rip out the general moral principle from that passage. Let me read to you how one author puts this. He says, The New Testament Gospels do not give us morals to help us along whatever path we have chosen in life. Instead, they tell us how God has so worked through Jesus that he demands what path we must take in life. The Gospel of Mark, he says, is a challenging book that calls on us to give our lives for Jesus and promises us that when we do so, we find life as it is meant to be lived. What's the introductory material for us? I think that's important as we approach any book of the Bible, as we just want to kind of get a lay of the land. Who wrote this? When did they write it? Why did they write it? What were they seeking to drive home? What are some things we need to watch out for as we come to this book? And now this morning, I want to jump right into it and have us look very quickly in the time we have remaining at the first eight verses of Mark's gospel. Let me read those for you now. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Well, from the very first verse here in Mark chapter 1, we are introduced to Mark's main point, the the thesis statement, the central point of the entire gospel. Verse 1 summarizes what Mark is after, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The very first word in the Greek here to Mark's gospel is this word arche beginning. It it points us back. It it reminds us of how the very Bible itself began in Arche, in the beginning. Uh, Mark here is introducing us to a new beginning. He's introducing us to a new age, the beginning of the fulfillment of all of God's covenantal and redemptive plans for his people. It's the beginning, he says, of the gospel. You know this Greek word, euangelion. The beginning of the gospel or the good news. It's that word that appears throughout Paul's writings used to refer to the message of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. A message that brings salvation from sin and judgment to all those who believe. Salvation from sin and judgment to all those who believe. It's a word, this euangelion word is a word that Mark's Roman audience would have been familiar with because it's not distinctly a Christian word. Uh, Mark's Roman Gentile audience would have been familiar with various euangelions, like pronouncements of good news for things like victory and battle. Even the the birth of Caesar Augustus himself was hailed as a euangelion. His birthday was said to have, quote, signaled the beginning of good news to the whole world. But Mark knows here that no birthday, that no military victory, in an earthly sense, qualifies truly as a euangelion in the fullest sense of the word. And so he uses this word now to refer to the ultimate good news, the ultimate good news of Christ coming into the world, the ultimate gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now those are two titles that Mark gives him here. Jesus, the first one, the Christ. You know, it's important for us to remember here, I'm embarrassed to tell you, though I think I've told you before, when I became a Christian in college, I had no background to the Bible. I, I remember sitting in my Old Testament class as I felt a call to ministry, and I'm raising my hand like, who was Abraham? Who, who was Moses? I didn't know who, all these Sunday school guys knew all these things, and I knew nothing. And I remember distinctly thinking that Christ was Jesus' last name. 
just like Ford is my last name, Zach Ford, Jesus Christ. But we have to remember Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is his title. It's that title showing that he is God's promised messianic king from the line of David that God's people have been looking forward to for centuries upon centuries. So he says it's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and secondly, the Son of God. This is a title that emphasizes the close relationship between this anointed king and God himself. It's a title we'll examine more next week as we come to the baptism of Jesus and we hear the voice of the Father speak, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So in this first verse, Mark gives us the thesis statement. He doesn't want to go more than one verse in this gospel, allowing you to second guess or to to wonder what his main point is. If right from the very beginning he makes it clear, this is a book about the good news of the messianic king, the divine son of God who has come into the world, and his name is Jesus. Now we move to verse 2, and as we move to verse 2, Mark is going to point us to this man named John. And we're calling him the, the forerunner, the forerunner of the Messiah. We're going to see a few things here in these verses. The first thing we see is John's foretelling. John's foretelling here in verses 2 and 3. Verse 2, Mark writes, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then he writes this Old Testament prophecy. Now, the, the quotation is identified as coming from Isaiah here, but it's actually a melding together of three different Old Testament passages, the most prominent of which comes from Isaiah. The first phrase, behold, I send my messenger before your face, actually comes from Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. And then that second phrase there, who will prepare your way, comes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And then in verse 3, this last reference comes from Isaiah 40, verse 3. And Mark melds together all three of these prophecies because all three of these prophecies foretold that one day the Messiah would come. But before that Messiah came, God would send a herald. And that herald's responsibility would be to prepare the way for the coming of that Messiah. The the, the herald would not be the Messiah, but he would prepare the way for the Messiah. And this was a fulfillment to prophecy that the Jews had been looking forward to for centuries upon centuries. In fact, the Jews even this day are still looking forward to the fulfillment of this prophecy. Even today, when Jews are gathered for the Passover meal, there's an empty chair at the table. And if you're a guest at the home of a Jewish family during the Passover meal, and you ask and you wonder, I wonder who this empty chair is for. We've got six around the table. Here's a seventh chair. Did someone not expected show up? Why do you have this empty chair around the table? They will explain to you that that empty chair is for Elijah. They remember very clearly the last prophecy of the book in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, that that prophecy and that promise that before the Messiah would come back, God would bring back Elijah. And God said that he would come once more before the Messiah would appear, and so the Jews are still awaiting him. But here in these opening verses, Mark is going, I'm going to suggest, to great lengths to show that here John the Baptist is actually the embodiment of Elijah. In the spirit of Elijah, John is the fulfillment of that Elijah promise that the Jews have been looking forward to for centuries. He was that forerunner that was foretold. That is what Mark is doing here. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, he gives these three prophecies. In the very next verse we read, verse 4, John appeared. He is the fulfillment of these prophecies. And in the very next verse in verse 4, we see not John's foretelling, but John's forthtelling. What it is that John is actually saying. Look at verse 4. He says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You see, in order to awake the people from their slumber, John comes onto the scene and he's calling for people to repent from their sins and to dedicate their lives to the Lord as he is preparing the way for the coming of the ministry of the Messiah. Now, this baptism that John was performing in the wilderness was a totally radical and wholly novel thing in his day. 
Uh, no one else had ever done it. Uh, the, the, the only thing that came close was that Gentiles actually were uh, baptized when they converted to Judaism, but even that was a baptism of ritual washing from the defilement of the past. But now John's coming onto the scene, and he's calling for everyone to be baptized, including Jews, something that had never been done in their history. Jews being baptized was unheard of. And this is why John himself is called the baptizer or John the Baptist. It was so radical that it defined his very person for all of history now. This was a baptism that John was focused on that was focused on the repentance of sin. And in a very calculated way, John's ministry here, Mark says, takes place in the wilderness, that biblical location that is closely connected to and tied to repentance throughout the Old Testament, closely tied to the meeting place of God and his prophets. The Jews that would have been reading this, though this was written to a primarily Roman Gentile audience, the Jews that were in this story, and perhaps they even would have been reading it, knew exactly why they were being called out to the wilderness. Just as their forefathers had, so now they were being called to the wilderness to come face to face with their sin, to come face to face with the impending judgment and to come face to face with their call to repentance. And so John is calling the people to get ready, to prepare the way to get ready for the Messiah's coming, to be cleansed from their sins, to repent and turn back to the Lord and to be baptized. And what happens? The people start responding, don't they? What we see next in verse 5, we see John's fame. We read in verse 5, in all the country of Judea, and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. You see, John's notoriety was becoming widespread and impressive. In fact, in a few decades after this book took place in the mid 50s, the Apostle Paul himself actually meets some disciples of John in the distant land of Ephesus. We can read about that in Acts 19. Verse 1 through 7, there were so many that had come, his fame was so widespread that later on, 30 years later in Ephesus, Paul is still meeting disciples of John. His fame was so widespread that the historian Josephus that was writing at the end of the first century actually spent more time devoted to writing about John than he did even about Jesus. You see, as we said in the beginning, we can't miss this fact that this was the most significant event that had happened to these people, and it had happened in this land for centuries, for over 300 years. Now, we know from other gospel accounts that not everyone responded well, did they? You can read in other gospel accounts of some of the heated run-ins that John had with the religious leaders and the Jewish leaders of his day, but that's not Mark's point here. Mark's point is to show that John came as the fulfilled forerunner, that he was to prepare the way of the Lord to make straight the path of the Messiah, and that's exactly what he was doing, and people were responding. Now we move on to verse 6, and Mark tells us something of John's fashion. We read in verse 6 that John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. I was talking to my wife last night about this passage, I can mention her because she's not here today because Ezra isn't feeling well, so I can mention her here in the service. We were talking, we were like, man, he must have looked awful and smelled awful. I mean, he's a wild-looking man, wasn't he? Why, why is Mark talking here about John's physical appearance? What, what in the world does his fashion have to do with anything and his dietary choices? What in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, all of this was very intentional by Mark. Uh, this was not the normal garb of the day. Uh, this would have been almost nearly as unusual in John's day as it would be in our day if someone showed up this morning wearing a tunic of camel's hair and eating, eating locusts and wild or eating locusts and honey. John was dressed this way and John acted in this way and Mark is making this point clearly because it is was it was specifically meant to hearken back to the prophet Elijah who himself wore, according to 2 Kings 1.8, a garment of hair and a leather belt around his waist. 
By focusing on his dress here, Mark is making the point, uh, the, the very clear point to associate John with Elijah very intentionally and very clearly showing his readers, here John is as the fulfillment of the prophet Elijah coming as the forerunner to the Messiah. And apparently the streams of crowds that were coming out of Judea, coming out of Jerusalem, that were coming out into the wilderness to uh, the river, the streams of them coming out were also making this connection very clear as well. The dawn of the new age was here, and people were responding. And the final thing we see in our passage here is John's focus. John's focus. You see, John was not ministering and preaching and proclaiming for himself only, was he? In fact, he was not the point at all. That's why I chose to title this sermon this morning, The Focus of the Forerunner. The Forerunner's uh, point and intention was never to draw attention to himself. It was always to draw his attention to someone else. And so we read in verses 7 and 8 of his focus. He says, And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You see, John is ending his ministry here. Mark is ending the record of John's ministry here by making it very clear what his focus was. His focus was squarely on the Messiah that was about to come. And notice here a few things that he says about this one to come. First, he says he is mightier than I. Throughout Mark's gospel, we will come face to face with this one who is mightier than John. This one who can cast out demons, this one who can declare sins forgiven, this one who can heal, this one who can control the elements of the nature, and this one who declares that he himself is God. Second John humbly says he is not worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. Uh, th- this loosing of sandals and washing of feet were duties of slaves in this day of John in in this day of Mark. In fact, only Gentile slaves in first century Judaism would have embarked upon this task. And John is declaring here with the utmost humility and subordination that in comparison to the Messiah that is to come, he is even less than a Gentile slave. And he is utterly unworthy to engage in this task of loosing and untying his sandals. Finally, he says in verse 8, that this one will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is an extraordinary statement by John. You see, in the Old Testament, the bestowal of the Holy Spirit was something that belonged only and exclusively to God. And now John is declaring here that this bestowal of the Spirit is something that Jesus himself will be able to do. Once again, indicating that Jesus will come in the power and in the very person of God himself, something that Mark is going to make crystal clear throughout his gospel. And with that, we come to the end of Mark's chronicle of the forerunner to the Messiah. As you look in your Bibles, we'll come next week to verse 9. The very next verse, we get right to the action. And we get right to the stories and the ministry of Jesus himself. It scenes that took Matthew 60 verses to arrive at. It scenes that took Luke 152 verses to arrive at. Mark now brings us to in just eight short verses. But even though these verses are incredibly uh, succinct and incredibly short comparatively, Mark makes it very clear with no hesitation that the dawn of the age of salvation in Jesus has come. That everything that the prophets have looked forward to, that everything that God's people have looked forward to, that all the promises that God has made for the redemptive purposes of his people, the age has come. The good news of Jesus is here. Now, as we close our time together this morning, I want to end by introducing you to two questions that we're going to ask about every passage. We won't necessarily close the sermon asking these two questions, but we should be asking and answering these two questions somewhere in our study of every passage for every passage that we come to. And here are those two questions. Number one, we're going to ask, what does Mark intend to teach us about Jesus in this passage? This is going to help us avoid the dangerous pitfalls that we talked about earlier. It's going to help us distill down the main and the basic 
point of every passage and, and see how God might apply his word to our lives every week. This first important question is the most important. What does Mark intend to teach us about Jesus in these pa this passage? And in this passage of the first eight verses, we can say several things, can't we? First, we're taught here that Jesus is that long-awaited for Messiah King that is the fulfillment of all of God's covenant purposes. We can say, secondly, that Mark teaches us here that Jesus is the Son of God, a theme that, like I said, we'll pick up next week. And third, we can say from this passage that Mark teaches us that Jesus is the one that is mightier than John and that the one who is coming after John will have the authority to bestow the Holy Spirit on all whom he chooses. Mark lifts Jesus high as the Messiah, the Son of God that he is in this passage. Now here's the second question that we'll ask of every passage. What does Mark intend to teach us about our response in this passage? So we first want to fix our gaze on Jesus. Who is Jesus? What does Mark say about him? And then we want to ask, what does Mark intend to convince us of on how we are to respond to this Jesus? And I think the main point that we can say from this passage this morning is that just as John preached to those gathered in his day, so too we must hear the call to confess our sins, to repent, and to return to God. Uh, we, we know the full story, don't we? Uh, so far, those reading Mark's gospel have only read this, and even then they would have come face to face with this reality. But we know the full story. We know all who Jesus was and what he has done. We can fill that in more clearly. And for us this morning, the response that we must ask is, have I and am I repenting of my sins, trusting in Christ alone for my salvation, and turning to God and giving my life to him? That those are two questions that we are going to ask of every passage, and I hope this morning that in this passage you come face to face with those two things. Well, he, here's my prayer as we embark on this study of Mark. As we embark on this study, whether you're here this morning, you're, you're live streaming, and you are a seasoned Christian who have been a follower of Jesus for 40 years, or, or whether you're a brand new Christian and you've been following Jesus for uh, four months, or maybe you come regularly or you live stream and you're not even a follower of Jesus yet. No matter where you are on this spectrum, my prayer is that as, as, as we walk verse by verse through this gospel, my prayer is that time and time again we would come face to face with the person of Jesus, the work of Jesus, and the good news of what God has done to save sinners like you and I, to reconcile sinners like you and I with himself, and to give us a meaningful life, a real, true, life-giving, meaningful life as followers and disciples of Jesus. That's my prayer for us this morning from this passage and my prayer for us through all of this book. I'm going to close us in prayer now. After I close us in prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to, before Steve closes us with our benediction, we're going to stand and sing together the doxology as we close our time together. Let's pray.